start. So, and yes, it's fine to be recorded. And um, I just want to thank um, Lada and the rest of the organizing um, team for inviting me to give this um, seminar um, today. So it's 10 o'clock in the morning, my time here um, in Maryland of the United States, but um, I'm looking forward um, to sharing some of the research me and my group have been doing on various endangered species. And I'll be talking about um, two examples today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And whoops. Go to presentation mode. And can everyone hear me and see my slides? Okay, excellent. So I'm going to go ahead. So <clears throat> I'm a geneticist. Um, I um, and I work at the Smithsonian um, Mason School of Conservation, which is a school within George Mason yeah. University. It's a university that is um, outside of Washington D.C., about an hour, hour and a half um, by car. And my office is located here in this upper photo. This is the campus of the, of the Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. So this is a research facility, but it's also a um, captive breeding facility. So here, um, you don't see it in this picture here, but um, we have a number of species of birds and um, mammals that we use to do captive breeding. So these are often the most in, um, endangered or critically endangered species in the world. And so we have a variety of different species, two of which I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So the main um, zoo is found in downtown Washington, DC. So um, about, again, going, going east. So this facility that you see the photo on the top is located in a city or a town. Actually, it's not a big city. It's a very small town called Front Royal, Virginia. And it's a very beautiful area, especially right now with the changing of the colors of the, of the leaves and everything like this. And we're located right next to one of the United States national parks called Shenandoah National Park. So the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation, this is a school that's dedicated to training conservation biologists in all aspects of that field um, to make future leaders and researchers um, if you want to work in government, at universities, or um, and non-governmental organizations to help preserve and understand um, nature around the world. So we train students from, you know, from undergraduates to graduate students and early career professionals through a variety of workshops that we teach um, at this school. And so my colleagues are often ecologists or organismal biologists. I'm a geneticist who works with genomics. Um, and I often do workshops or um, lectures um, in courses related to endangered species conservation. So for today's talk, <laughs> I want to emphasize the importance of genetic diversity. And um, so we consider three types of biodiversity very important. So the diversity of species, which is just the number of species in any given geographic area. The diversity of the ecosystem, so the different types of communities and habitats that are found in particular geographic locations, and then the diversity of genes, or what we call genetic biodiversity. And this is basically the genes that make up, um, you know, how much differences there are we find among individuals within a species or populations within a species. And this, um, these three types of biodiversity have been considered very, very important. Um, to preserve all different aspects of, um, you know, biodiversity from species to ecosystems all the way to genetic diversity. So there are international organizations and the United Nations, for example, is organizing um, protocols to help protect um, as much of this, these different types of biodiversity around the world as possible. So, um, when I talk about genetic diversity, um, from any sort of point of view, from evolution down to conservation biology, we know that this is very important. So genetic diversity just basically describes the differences in DNA sequences among individuals within a species or among 
populations within a species. And there's all different types of um, genetic diversity that we can describe all the way from, you know, substitutions or single nucleotide polymorphisms, insertions, deletions, and then structural variation, things like deletions and translocations, inversions and duplications. So we know from many studies, especially of model organisms like humans and domesticated animal and plant species, that these are the most common types of variation and they're distributed differently from population to population within a species or between different species. From a conservation perspective, we think that you know, more genetic diversity is better. There's no specific you know, metric that tells you how much uh, um, diversity um, is needed um, for evolution to occur. We just know that the more, the better um, for evolution and conservation biology programs. Increased individual and population fitness. Um, so this is directly related to the amount of um, genetic diversity. So the more genetic diversity, the more individual and um, population fitness we um, think there is. And then um, genetic diversity is in important with regards to this concept called adaptive potential. So since species can't predict, um, nobody can predict, for example, how the environment will change in the future, the idea is that the more genetic diversity a population contains, the better it will be able to adapt to any potential changes in the environment in the future. So from a conservation biology perspective, we usually focus on understanding um, the causes of um, or the effects of, of small populations on population persistence. So as a conservation geneticist, I work in the area called the small population paradigm. So this is one of the two main paradigms in conservation biology. So the small population paradigm, we try to understand the effects of genetic drift, deleterious variation or damaging mutations, inbreeding and inbreeding depression. And that's in contrast to the declining population paradigm where we try to understand the causes of populations becoming smaller and endangered over time. Now, often, you know, this is sort of a false dichotomy, but um, because we often, you know, work in both of these paradigms, regardless of whether you're an ecologist or a geneticist, because, you know, to, we under, often understand the causes or of populations declining and their effects of this decline on their genetic diversity. And so why we're so concerned about genetic diversity is that we know from empirical studies, laboratory studies um, of both wild and captive and laboratory populations, that small populations can become so genetically um, you know, homogenous, that is they lose so much genetic diversity over time that they, can, um, they become a higher and higher at risk of entering what's called the extinction vortex which means that small fragmented isolation populations have an increased risk of inbreeding, which causes a loss of genetic diversity that reduces the adaptability and the fitness of the population in terms of survival and reproduction. And that then re reduces the population even further in size. And then you eventually spiral eventually to the point of extinction where you just don't have any genetic variation or population numbers to sustain that population for any long period of time. So, as a conservation biologist and geneticist, you know, we try to understand populations to avoid this scenario as much as possible. Now, the type of populations I work on um, are what we call ex situ or captive populations. So populations that are outside of the natural habitat of species. And so these include populations found in like zoological parks or aquariums or botanical gardens. They also include gene banks, like, you know, when we preserve you know, seed banks of domesticated plant species. Um, but zoos and botanical gardens, you know, they, what they are trying to also do um, back in the late 20th century, the mission of zoos changed um, from entertainment to education to also include um, conservation. That is, we could preserve populations, especially of very endangered species, because um, in zoos, in botanical gardens, we could establish what are called insurance populations. That is, if the populations went extinct, the wild populations went extinct in the wild, well, we still will have these captive populations that we could use to repopulate the, the former wild habitats of the wild populations. And so our charge um, in maintaining species in um, ex situ settings or in captive settings like zoos is to increase or maintain genetic diversity 
keep genetic records to prevent inbreeding. And there's a variety of ways of doing this and assist captive breeding for reintroduction in the wild. That is, we often, you know, in order to maintain genetic diversity in a small captive populations, we basically decide, humans decide who gets to breed with whom in order to maximize um, the amount of genetic diversity or uh, prevent inbreeding. And of course, caring for animals or plants also in, means that we have to understand their nutritional needs. We have to do a good job of uh, taking care of them. That's what husbandry is. That is, we give them, understand their needs in terms of living and um, thriving in a captive setting. And that also involves a lot of um, work by veterinarians who um, maintain and monitor the health of these captive populations. And so from my perspective, working on genetics and now genomics of such populations, I see a number of advantages um, um, for working with such populations. So the sampling, unlike wild populations, are relatively accessible and fresh because I can work directly with veterinarians who, you know, these the animals I work with usually get at least um, get a checkup once or twice a year. And I can ask the veterinarians to draw me a blood sample that we can use for um, genomic study. The population history of these populations are often known, but not always. The clinical metadata um, that are that comes from veterinarians who monitor these animals on a regular basis um, can become very valuable um, for understanding, for example, the genetic causes of certain issues in these populations. They provide an experimental system to test population genetic theory because captive populations tend to be small and depending on how they're managed in captivity, they provide various ways that we can use to predict um, outcomes based on population genetic theory. They provide a fertile testing ground for conservation genetic phenomenon so we can monitor or assess genetic drift, the loss of genetic diversion or erosion, diversity or erosion, um, mutational load, inbreeding depression, and increase or decreased adaptive potential in these populations. And because these veterinarians monitor these populations so well, we can also use um, these populations to test, you know, the correlation or association of, feet, of genotypes with their particular phenotypes. And I'll show some examples of that um, in my talk today. And of course, all the data that we collect and analyze has direct applications to basically improving or bettering the conservation management of these endangered species and their populations in captivity. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you just sort of an overview of um, the pipeline we've been using in our various um, species systems. And basically what we always begin with is generating a reference genome assembly of our target species. So, you know, we'll have fresh high molecular weight genomic DNA and use that to prepare various types of genomic libraries. Um, and then we'll use next generation sequencing technologies um, to you know, generate the sequencing reads. And we often, in nowadays, we usually include high C data. So high throughput chromosomal confirmation capture data in order to generate chromosome like assemblies, which simplifies a lot of our analyses downstream and makes, um, makes the interpretation of our analyses and the data much easier um, to comprehend. So once we have a genome assembly, we'll then, you know, uh, put that through um, various annotation pipelines to, you know, determine the coding versus the non-coding regions of the genome. And then once we have that basic reference assembly and annotation, then we'll resequence. Um, often, right now, using short read sequencing technologies, we'll sequence multiple individuals of of our species. So. This could be as few as you know, le less than ten individuals, or you know, in some cases now we, um, for some of our antelope species we've been working on, we now have more than a hundred genomes um, from captive populations of a species. So we'll do genome resequencing. We'll map those sequencing reads of those individuals against the reference assembly, call variants, filter them um, in terms of quality, and so on. Um, and then we'll proceed um, to conduct our various analyses, like estimating genome-wide genetic diversity, looking at mutational load, deleterious variants, infer demographic history, and also conduct comparative analyses. So often we have endangered species and we can compare them to non-endangered um, 
you know, closely related species that are not endangered and have different population histories to understand what the impact, for example, of an endangered species population history has had on its, on its genome. So the first species um, I'm going to talk about is this um, beautiful gazelle, the Dama gazelle. So this is actually the world's largest gazelle. Not many people know about this, but it's actually found in zoos across, you know, Europe and Japan and in the United States um, and elsewhere as well. And most of the, the species exists only in captivity. And before I proceed uh, with describing the study, I just want to acknowledge, you know, the wonderful team of researchers um, that have participated in our Dama Gazelle um, genomic research. So a lot of colleagues from the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. So where we have, we have Dama Gazelles at the National Zoo and in Front Royal where I work. Um, and I have to give a big shout out to um, Dr. Pavel de Brennan and Mr. Guy Tamazian who um, led um, the analyses and the research on the Dama Gazelle. Um, that I'll be talking to you about today and showing you the, their results. Um, and so they did a tremendous job of analyzing these genomes. So just a little background, um, this species used to be um, found and distributed across um, North Africa. And the, um, the, the outline that you see there in green is what its former range used to be. And based on um, taxonomy, three subspecies were described largely based on differences in their color patterns. So we have the um, Adra gazelle here in um, Eastern Africa, and then the Mohor gazelle here in um, Northwestern Africa. So the Mohor gazelle has a darker um, you know, coat color compared to the um, Adra gazelle in the East. And then in between them, they had an intermediate form called um, the Central or Central Dama gazelle. Um, because it was found in the center of its range. Now, in terms of um, these the species, we only find Mohor gazelles and Adder gazelles now mostly in captivity. So this species, basically, there's, there's less than 100 adult animals of this species left in their original range. And, and again, make note that this range used to be gigantic. People often forget that the northern half of Africa, you know, the entire United States can fit within the northern half of Africa. So this was a gigantic, um, a gigantic range that this species once um, covered. But today, like I said, um, we find less than 100 individuals back in the wild. So the 100 to 200 um, figure comes from basically about five years ago. Um, there's about 600 or so in zoos around the world. Um, they're also found in private collections in Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. But amazingly, and this is what always is shocking to a lot of people, is that most of these animals are um, maintained on private ranches in the state of Texas in the United States. So two thirds of the entire remaining populations of this species is found, uh, you know, basically belongs to private individuals who maintain these, these, this species on their ranches. So it is a critically endangered species and um, it is the Lord's largest gazelle. But again, you know, most people don't pay much attention to them because, you know, one gazelle looks like every other gazelle, but this is a really special gazelle because of its particular history and that it's so unique in terms of other gazelle species. So why we got involved in working with the species is that we thought that given the large number of animals that are found in private ranches um, in Texas, that this could be a tremendous resource for basically supplementing the ex situ populations that we find in zoos um, in both the United States and elsewhere in the world and provides a really great source for animals to reintroduce back into the wild. And so starting just about four years ago, people have been starting to reintroduce Dama gazelles back into their um, native habitat in North Africa, starting in the country of Chad and also in Morocco um, through various efforts by European zoos and American zoos and private ranches in Texas. So the idea is that, you know, we could better manage this species like, like Dama gazelles and other antelope species that because in zoos, which are often found in cities and don't have a lot of space, we can't have large populations of these animals. But places like, um, like private ranches that are often huge in size, so have 
these ranchers often contain lots of land, and so they can grow their populations to very large size. This provides a really great resource for animals. And so the idea is that if we could use genetics and um, you know, demographic or population modeling, um, this could help basically facilitate the management of these um, species by, you know, for example, exchanging animals between ranches and zoos. Um, so sometimes we bring animals from ranches and bring them to zoos, and then from sometimes in zoos, we bring them to ranches. And because the number of animals on ranches is so much greater than we find in the total world zoo population, this will increase and maintain genetic diversity much better compared to if we only manage these populations separately, like just within ranches or just say within zoos. So this is one of the reasons we wanted to get involved in a species like this to basically help um, improve its management by adding empirical genomic data to understand what genetic diversity there is today and how that genetic diversity can be improved by better management practices, for example, by exchanging animals between zoos and ranches. And so what's interesting, I'm gonna talk about the two subspecies that are found um, in captivity today. So the Adra gazelle and the Mohor gazelle. So the Adra is here on the left and the Mohor is here on the right. And so they had very different histories when in terms of how they were brought into captivity. So, and I'm here, I'm only talking about the animals that are found in North America or in the US population. So Adra gazelles were brought into the US in 1967 from about 23 founders. So that means 23 different animals of males and females are brought into um, a zoo at the beginning of their captive breeding program in 1967 in the US. So given that founding population size, we'd expect that the genetic diversity would be higher uh, with lower inbreeding and maybe a higher mutational load. And that is in contrast to the Mahor gazelle because by the time the Mahor gazelle was brought into captivity and it was first brought into captivity in Europe um, back in the 19, late 1970s, there were only five animals of this entire subspecies left. So there was one male and four females, and those were rescued and brought into a um, captive facility in southern Spain, and a captive breeding program was started. Then 10 years, uh, just a few years later, six animals were found, were brought into um, the United States in 1980, um, just as an additional insurance population in case that the Spanish population would go extinct. And so this species obviously went through a dramatic bottleneck, um, not only in, before it was brought into captivity, but even when it was brought into captivity. And so we'd expect that the genetic diversity would be lower, inbreeding would be higher, and the mutational load might also be higher compared to the Adra gazelle. And so <clears throat> we can analyze um, this species using um, a variety of te techniques. And so these are um, SND density or single nucleotide variant density plots. So this basically is a sliding window analysis that compares the um, density of single nucleotide variants um, over say window sizes of one megabase pairs. And you know we slide that one megabase pair across the different chromosomal scaffolds and just ask, you know, what is the average SNP density that we find um, in a segment of the genome? And so then we can basically transfer um, or transfer those um, those data into, or yeah, transfer those into heat maps that just gives you an idea of the genetic diversity across um, um, the, the various chromosomal scaffolds of an individual. So what you see here on the top is um, a typical SND density plot of an Adra gazelle. Um, on the bottom is one for the Mahor gazelle, and the hotter the colors, that is the you know the more yellows, oranges, and reds the more diversity there is. The colder the colors, blues, um, the less diversity there is. And so you can see that there's a striking contrast between the Adra and the Mohor gazelle. Mohor gazelle having much higher um, SNV density compared to the Mohor gazelle. And so when we then basically <clears throat> estimate the genome-wide heterozygosity, that is an estimate of genetic diversity in the population, we, for example, see, yes, that the, um, in this case, we have three Mahor Adra gazelles and two Mahor gazelles, that the Adra gazelles have twice as much um, genetic diversity or heterozygosity compared to the Mahor gazelles. We also compared um, 
the Dama gazelles to the Grant's gazelle. So the Grant's gazelle is a uh, another gazelle species that's not endangered, has very large population sizes, not, um, you know, um, the populations are doing quite fine. And so we'd expect that this species would be much different to the Dama gazelle, and indeed it is. It, they, um, the Grant's gazelle genome that was available has <clears throat> higher diversity that's even higher um, compared to the Edra gazelle, and certainly higher than the Mohor gazelle. So the next thing we can uh, look at is um, inbreeding. Um, population bottlenecks and inbreeding events um, in populations leave a distinct signature in the genome, which are called runs of homozygosity. That is basically regions of the genome that have lost um, um, their genetic diversity because of a particular phenomenon that inbreeding causes. So here's just basically a schematic of how this looks. So just take two individuals, a male and a female, they produce an offspring, say a brother and a sister, and then say that those that brother and sister produce an offspring. They mate and produce an offspring. Um, and that's a severe inbreeding event, right? Because you're taking very closely related individuals and breeding them together. And so what happens is that, you know, particular haplotypes within the genome will basically be inherited and increase in size. So the greater, and we call that that basically that transmission of this runs of homozygosity as an ancestral haplotype, um, a signature of inbreeding. So the more inbreeding there is, and um, the more recent that inbreeding is, the larger these haplotype blocks of runs of homozygosity will be. And so when we look at, for example, different signatures in the genome, what we expect for the Adra gazelle and the Mohor gazelle is that um, these plots, these graphs that you see here at the bottom on the right side, so there should be a higher number of runs of homozygosity. So n is number, and the sum of the total runs of homozygosity of the genome should also be higher in more inbred species compared to a less inbred or outbred species. And this is exactly what we find um, in the um, Dama gazelle. So on the top are basically our three individuals of Dama of Adra gazelles. And basically these different um, columns of different colors show different sizes of blocks of runs of homozygosity. So from 200 to 500,000 base pairs, from half a million base pairs to a million to greater than a million base pairs. So we see relatively small proportions of each of these in our three um, Adra gazelles, but we see higher proportions of each of these in the two um, Mahor gazelles, especially in the middle category. There seems to be very high levels of uh, <clears throat> runs of homozygosity in the half a million to one million base pair range. And this corresponds very well with you know, the population history of, um, of uh, Mohor gazelles relative to um, Adra gazelles, exactly what we predict um, based on population genetic theory. And so one thing that's also related to the amount of runs of homozygosity is that you know, these regions should be enriched also for higher levels of deleterious or damaging mutations. So we, we use bioinformatic methods to classify how many, for example, loss of function mutations are found or missense mutations are found in um, adragazelles versus mahorgazelles. So, Damaging mutations can be found either in the heterozygous state. So basically say, you know, there's a position in the genome where there's an AC, or it could be found in the homozygous state. So a, a site in the genome where it's AA or CC, for example. And one of those is um, a deleterious mutation or a loss of function mutation. And so when we compare the adragazelles to the um, horgazelles, what we'd expect based on population genetic theory is that there should be a higher number of heterozygous mutations found in the um, Adra gazelles, simply because larger populations carry more potential damaging mutations in the heterozygous state compared to the Adra gazelle, uh, sorry, it, compared to the Mohor gazelle, which is exactly what we find. However, when we then find, what we then would also predict is that there should be more fixed homozygous mutations in the Mohor gazelle relative to the Adra gazelle. And so we mapped our individuals against our reference genome assembly. And so, yeah, we find much higher levels of deleterious, um, uh, you know, synonymous mutations 
sorry, missense mutations um, in the two adder, in the two Mahor gazelles compared to the adder gazelles. And the scale here, of course, is dominated, the y-axis is dominated by the great number of missense mutations and synonymous mutations. But if you look, for example, count the number of deleterious or loss of function mutations in the Mohor gazelles, it's three times as many in the two Mohor gazelles compared to the Adder gazelles. So again, based on population genetic theory and the history of these two um, subspecies populations, they are showing us data that conform to population genetic theory expectations. Now we can dig deeper into those loss of function mutations or the missense mutations to understand, for example, how some of those mutations might directly impact the phenotype of um, the species. And so, you know, often we have a list of candidate genes that have been affected by damaging mutations and we don't, we try to make sense of them, you know, using gene ontology enrichment um, analyses and something like this um, or similar types of analyses. And so, but we had some data um, from past studies because um, these gazelles have been very well studied from um, a reproductive standpoint. So one of the things that we often see in um, inbred um, species that have gone through population bottlenecks is a decrease in male fertility. That is, male fertility has been lost or has been compromised because of inbreeding um, and likely the fixation of deleterious variants. So back in um, 2010 and 2012, Researchers in Spain working with um, Dama gazelles in their captive facility measured, for example, the proportion of, of normal sperm and abnormal sperm in male Dama gazelles, uh, particularly, and they basically divided their Dama gazelles into Mohor gazelles and Adra gazelles. And so what they found is that there is a relationship between um, the percent of normal sperm, which is on the y-axis, versus the standardized multi-locus heterozygosity. So this is a measure of genetic diversity. So, you know, here towards um, the origin is the lower diversity. Here on the other side is higher diversity. So you see this negative relationship between, you know, genetic diversity and the percentage of normal sperm, which decreases. And so, they can look at sperm underneath the microscope. And, you know, we see, for example, on here on the right side, A on the top, this is a normal Dama gazelle sperm. All the other photos are of abnormal sperm. So there's an, this is a syndrome called teratospermia, which is also found in humans and other domesticated species um, of mammals, for example, that it's very, very common to see this sort of thing, especially in highly inbred families or um, in domesticated species population. And so why do we focus on, on infertility? So infertility not only affects the males, but it also affects the productivity of the females. So fertility, of course, is a key fitness trait. That is, it determines you know, how many offspring um, are produced every generation. It influences the pregnancy success in females. So that's the female productivity. It's directly associated with genetic diversity and inbreeding depression from you know, basically more than 100 years of study, we've known about this. And this is a good um, trait that has a very strong genotype and phenotype association, meaning that a lot of genetic studies have directly tied, you know, um, deleterious variants or mutations in genes that, for example, are associated with sperm development, sperm function, and um, motility and fertilization, um, directly with damaging mutations. And so we see this in many different um, species. Um, <clears throat> and so this is from a paper summarizing this in mammals. Um, so that, you know, the percentage of modal sperm or, yeah, um, is directly related to um, different types of, you know, is related to heterozygosity. So if you look here on the right side, um, this plot shows basically, you know, the black circles are species that are endangered. Um, whereas the open circles are non-endangered species. And so again, we see this um, negative correlation between the amount of heterozygosity and the percentage of normal or you know, motile sperm. So number four is actually, um, number four on this graph is the black-footed ferret. Um, number, number one is the Florida panther. Number three is the cheetah. Um, this is another study, another species that, for example, um, Pavel de Brennan um, analyzed during his PhD at um, St. Petersburg State University. Um, and so 
there's a strong relationship. We've known about this for a long time. And so what Pasha and Dyke did is that they really dug down into the genome of um, the Dama gazelles and especially focused on the um, deleterious variants that are found in genes associated with reproduction. And so here is an example of a gene that's directly tied um, to male infertility in humans. It's a gene called NPHP4. And this is a gene that is usually expressed, is also important in kidney cellular function, but also is involved in gonadal development. So what they found, for example, is in this gene is that, you know, there is a frame shift mutation in the Mohor gazelle that disrupts the coding sequence um, in the Mohor gazelles. And this is homozygous in the um, Mohor gazelles and in the, in the more gazelles that we analyzed, but is heterozygous in the adder gazelles that were analyzed. And so what you can see here, so on the top is the nucleotide sequence, on the bottom is the, um, is the amino acid sequence. So you can see that, you know, this frame shift basically disrupts um, the reading frame and causes <clears throat> basically a loss of function, you know, that we predicted bioinformatically of this particular protein. So it's really great that you can do, you know, analyses like this to tie basically genetic variants that in, are inferred to be damaging to a particular fitness phenotype in, you know, an endangered species. And so the question now becomes, you know, how do we uh, manage the species? Um, some ideas have been to um, basically breed um, these two subspecies together, even though, you know, the taxonomy of these species has been established for more than hundred years. And of course, they are phenotypically different because of their color differences and, you know, horn morphologies are slightly different as well. And there's also this concern that, you know, you could affect um, the survival of offspring because of outbreeding depression. The outbreeding depression is the idea is that maybe Adra and Mohor gazelles are so different from each other that we shouldn't breed them together because their offspring would have lower fitness than their, their, their parental, their parents, basically. And, you know, the idea is <clears throat> there's also concern about whether we lose, you know, the integrity of, you know, we're mixing up, you know, populations that have been separated possibly for long evolutionary, um, for, for a long time during evolutionary history. Well, we wanted to address this, and this sort of has been addressed initially using mitochondrial DNA. So a colleague of mine at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland in the United Kingdom Dr. Helen Sen looked at mitochondrial DNA sequences of different subspecies of Mohor gazelles and published this paper back in 2014 and showed that there was no real strong difference between different genetic variants found in different subspecies of, of, of Dama gazelles. And so this was used as an argument that perhaps we could use, um, we could use, we could use this information to basically, you know, make it okay to breed different subspecies of Dama gazelles together. And this is, was exactly what was done um, in a zoo in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates starting in 2015. So they set up an experimental population where they basically bred um, um, Adra gazelles with Mohor, Mohor gazelles. So they did reciprocal um, mating. So a male Adra gazelle with a female Mohor gazelle and a female Adra gazelle with a male Mohor gazelle. And then they tracked basically, you know, what their offspring looked like. And this, experiment is now in the sixth generation um, phase. And so the preliminary evidence suggests that there's actually no problems that, you know, the offspring of these um, subspecies matings are, are fine. They're actually very fertile. The neonate mortality, that is the offspring survival during the first year of life is, is quite good. Um, it's actually better than it is than, you know, for example, when we're looking at just pure um, Mohor gazelles. And there's no obvious physiological or behavioral or morphological differences. What we see, for example, is that Mohor gazelles mated with Adder gazelles are, they look like the other third gazelle subspecies. They're sort of intermediate between the parents. But by all intent and purposes, they look like perfectly healthy um, animals. So we've used our genome data, Geik and um, Pasha used the genome data to analyze how different are these two populations of, of more gazelle. So we use the sliding window approach to basically, you know, look at how different um, they are. And so 
what we can see, for example, is that you know, using a sliding window of 50 kV, that the number of differences or number of different alleles you know, in a particular window is, tends to be very small on average. And then we compared you know, the two subspecies to, the, to their close relative, the grass gazelle. So it's a completely different species. So you know, there's <clears throat> almost 15 times more differences, um, or sorry, 10 times more differences between you know, Grant's gazelles and the two um, subspecies of, of, of um, Dama gazelles. So the two subspecies, you know, they seem very different um, genetically. And so you know, we can summarize this by looking at the overall level of um, differences in the two subspecies. So, um, there's about three times as much difference between um, Adra and Amhor gazelle as there are uh, between um, two um, Adra gazelles. And there's also just a slight increase in number of differences in the mitochondrial genome between these two subspecies, but not a lot. It's not, these aren't very big differences when you consider the entire size of the genome, which is about 2.9 gigabases. And then we used um, <clears throat> a, a alternative method of the pairwise sequential Markovian coalescent method to estimate, for example, how different um, and how long ago these two subspecies last shared a common ancestor or exchanged genes. And so I did this, this work was done in collaboration with Dr. James Cahill at the University of Florida, who pioneered this technique called the hybrid um, PSMC uh, method. And the idea is that you just basically are mixing alleles of the two populations together and getting an idea of when their um, population, effective population size trajectory, uh, trajectory start to diverge from one another. And so what we estimate is that, you know, these two subspecies last shared a common ancestor 65,000 years ago. But again, doing different modeling in terms of like, when is the last time, you know, they might've exchanged genes with each other. And our data suggests that you know, it could be anywhere between 10,000 years ago uh, up to 65,000 years ago. So that's a very small, um, you know, short time um, in terms of evolutionary history. So we think that these populations, you know, were mixing with each other, you know, quite uh, in, in, the, in the recent past, you know, um, not too long ago. So again, and that supports basically the idea that, you know, genetically they're very similar to each other. But one thing we also did is that we looked at the um, chromosome numbers in these different populations of Dama gazelles, because it was well known since the late 1970s that Dama gazelles contain three different um, chromosome numbers in their species, so which we call cytotypes. So there are some individuals that carry around 38 pairs of chromosomes, some that 39, and some are 40. And the difference is mostly caused by um, translocations from autosomes onto sex chromosomes. So for example, here's a Adra gazelle where chromosome 15 and 16 have been attached to the X and Y chromosome of this male. And so uh, we went to the zoos, um, especially the San Diego Zoo in California that basically karyotyped all their animals um, that they ever maintain in their, in their zoo. And so this is unpublished data that we got access to, and um, they had a large Mahor uh, captive breeding program at the San Diego Zoo. And so what we find is that, yes, there are um, variations in the numbers of these different cytotypes. We had a smaller sample size for Adra gazelle, which were also maintained at the San Diego Zoo. But basically, we don't find any major differences between subspecies. That is, you'll find similar numbers of the different cytotypes in the different subspecies. And this is really borne out by when we mapped, for example, when we mapped um, the when we mapped the cytotypes onto the pedigree of Mahor gazelles at the San Diego Zoo. So basically, here's the founder population of six individuals that were that came in in 1980, and then they started uh, karyotyping at the third generation. And so what you can see, for example, is here are two. Um, 39 cytotypes, you know, stud book number 5042 and stud book 5033, and they produce um, six different offspring that represent all different types, the, the three different types of cytotypes as well. So there's no assortment between um, subspecies and the number of chromosomes. This is often one of the um, concerns about outbreeding depression that, you know, if you put 
populations together that had different chromosome numbers, then um, this could lead to um, basically reduced fitness or need, um, offspring, you know, um, the poor offspring survival. But this does not seem to be the case in this species at all. So, and so our data, even though, you know, what we're trying to do is not necessarily decide, um, you know, what is, how to best manage this species, that this data does tell us that if people wanted to breed the two subspecies together, you know, from a genomic point of view, this wouldn't have a big impact because they are genetically different from one another, even though they do show this morphological difference in coat color pattern. So um, I think um, I'm going to end it there. Um, I'm going to just, you know, um, I'm going to just, you know, sort of given, you know, using the Dama gazelle as an example, you know, just, you know, provides a nice um, example of how we can use genomic data to understand endangered populations of species as well, especially those that are found in captive breeding. So, you know, the genome data provides a snapshot of current genetic diversity found in ex situ populations. That diversity is directly related to the population history of the species, you know, past bottleneck events like we see in the Mahor gazelle, the number of founders, the breeding system, and how they are managed in breeding history can be um, reliably inferred. Mutational load can be inferred, but should be interpreted with caution with regards to individual and population fitness and further tested with other methods. So, with regards to that, you know, what we're now doing with um, Dama gazelles is that um, at the National Zoo, where I work, um, at the Smithsonian National Zoo, um, we collect um, sperm samples for males of this species. And so we can do transcriptomic analysis. So if we, for example, find an individual with a higher proportion of, of, of damaged sperm or poor, you know, poor sperm morphology versus another one that shows a higher proportion of normal sperm, then we could do transcriptomic methods to try to really get further into the genes that might be explaining, you know, those differences in sperm quality. And of course, genomic data can make important contributions to ensure population genetic health, inform ex situ management practices, like the, you know, mixing um, Adra and Mahor gazelles, and, you know, inform reintroduction and translocation efforts. So this is becoming important. My colleagues over in Scotland are using genomic data to basically help decide which animals would be best to put back into um, the wild of North Africa for this species. And this information also helps us to, you know, preserve and sustain adaptive potential for the future. And so, you know, what, the way I see genomic data is that um, even though I'm a conservation geneticist, I couldn't do my job without interacting with all the other people um, who are my colleagues at the zoo, especially veterinarians and animal caretakers. That is the people who directly work with these animals every day and notice the, you know, strange things or unique things about, you know, every animal because what they see is that every animal is different. And so, you know, this is a nice figure showing basically where genomic scientists fit in with helping to maintain the health and genetic diversity of, you know, populations within zoos. So basically, you know, um, genomic data informs basically what we call the species survival plan. That can basically inform who, you know, should be mated with whom um, to maintain genetic diversity. It informs the species management plan in terms of how many animals we should have in a place. And it also works with basically, you know, informing how, you know, if animals become sick or have problems, maybe because of inbreeding, genomic scientists can um, work with veterinarians to help understand the causes and possible solutions of those efforts as well. Yeah, and um, I'll end it there and uh, be happy to take um, any questions? Hello. So uh, most of the methods uh, are about uh, how they uh, they fit in uh, the zoos in the captive environment. But what if uh, there is even no point to introduce them into the Africa back because uh, they just like uh, lose uh, lost uh, evolutionary rate and uh, race and there are for example some other gazelles that just better fit and they will uh, 
push them again? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, we try to avoid getting to a situation like that as much as possible. So, you know, Adra gazelles have a lot of genetic diversity. Mahor gazelles have less, but not to the point where we think that they're, um, they're you know, that their genetics would actually harm them. Um, we still think that both of those subspecies have a lot of, you know, genetic diversity for evolutionary or adaptive potential. Um, and it's more about, you know, the causes, you know, I didn't explain why these species became extinct in the wild or were lost in their wild. It was just mostly because of overhunting by humans, right? And they also lived, their range overlapped in countries um, that <clears throat> had armed conflict and so on and so forth, where people were just would randomly shoot these animals, you know, to the point where their populations just eventually collapsed to a small size. And so that's why like back in the 1960s and 1970s, some, you know, forward looking, forward looking um, biologists thought that, you know, it would be best to have insurance populations of these um, popula of these subspecies in, you know, European zoos, American zoos and elsewhere. Um, and that has, you know, rescued that species. If this didn't happen, we think, you know, this species would likely be extinct today. Because um, even 2,500 isn't a large number. And, you know, one disease outbreak is all it takes to basically wipe out, you know, a very small population. So we, we try to, you know, manage these populations as best as possible. And luckily, you know, within the last five years, there's been reserves that have been opened up starting in Chad and now in Mauritania and in Morocco that, um, you know, people working with the local um, authorities and scientists and biologists in those countries who want to see this animal come back into their former range. And they're the ones that are really pushing, you know, to bring this animal back um, into, you know, their former range countries. So, but there's very few examples of species where it's gotten so, you know, they're so small. I mean, there are, there are, are species like this, like that, especially species that are found on small, small islands that already have very, very low genetic diversity. And even in captivity, you know, we're not being, we're going to be able to bring back any of that diversity. And so there's also a thinking now that you know, some small populations are adapted to being having low diversity, even though they might be threatened by low adaptive potential. That is, if there is a significant change in their future environment, they may not be able to survive that that change or adapt quick enough to deal with that change. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question. Thank you yeah. for the presentation. Uh, have you thought about uh, the uh, genetic modification of uh, Mohor gazelle to increase uh, the fitness just by, uh, uh, just by fixing this uh, unfertility problem? Yes. Uh... Are you referring to like genome editing techniques? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a great question. And this is something, you know, that is actively being discussed for a number of endangered species that is using like CRISPR uh, gene editing technologies to fix damaging mutations. We're not thinking about this so much uh, um, for the Adri, uh, so, sorry, for the Mahor gazelle. Um, because we now have evidence, you know, from our colleagues um, who work with this species, this subspecies in European zoos, that it seems that most of the damaging mutations have now been purged from the population. That is, yes, there are damaging mutations, but um, <clears throat> you know, the question I think you know it's it's interesting because there, given that there is this discussion of using like CRISPR editing technology. Um, that's all well and good, but you know our understanding of the genes that we find these damaging uh, these damaging mutations in is very still relatively poor. Now, you know the genes related to male infertility are better known than a lot of the other genes, but then there's a concern whether you know there might be off-target effects. I mean, I know that you know CRISPR technology is getting better and better and more accurate, but there's a concern right now of off-target effects and. You know, the conservation biologists who really focus on this species 
they really think that, you know, breeding these animals, breeding mahor gazelles with adder gazelles is probably the best approach. That is, you know, within a few generations, as this experimental population in the United Arab Emirates I, show, I told you about shows, is that even within the first or second generations, a lot of the problems that we see in mahor gazelles, they disappear completely by just, you know, breeding with a more genetically diverse species. And that's likely because simply those damaging mutations are now in the heterozygous state, they're masked, right? And so, or, you know, they can also be eventually removed um, over time through purging effects. But again, you know, um, we are discussing this um, with regards to other um, endangered species that have much more damaging mutations and where genetics is really threatening their future. But it'll be interesting. There are, there are, um, certain organizations I know about in Europe and the US that are pursuing this type of research to help endangered species through gene editing technologies. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank, yes. thank you so much uh, for the lecture. I have a question about yeah. the dangerous in operation. I mean, for example, when uh, I was studying the genetic materials, it's easy to get it from blood, but um, you said that um, if uh, some some person have a high level of uh, sperma, uh, you could understand the uh, you could to investigate the uh, transcriptome data, and I think that you are getting it, uh, the function from uh, X or from other uh, I mean uh, important uh, tissues. And is it is it not so dangerous to uh, mm, to uh, make, make some problem with the future uh, reproductive ability for this um, organism and how you usually fix this problem and fix this uh, danger uh, opportunity. Yeah. And this so, and any other. Yeah. No, this is, a, this is also a very good question. So we use like for our Oh, so when we annotate our um, reference genome assembly, we usually use um, RNA-seq data to help inform the annotation. So it provides species-specific transcripts, right, to help inform the annotation. And what's also nice is that, you know, working at a zoo, you know, animals die, right? And so I work with the veterinarians and then the pathologists, that is, the ones who basically dissect the animals after they die to understand the cause of death. And I work with these pathologists to directly collect um, the, um, I'm usually there during the necropsy, that is when they dissect the dead animal. And I'm there with my tubes to be able to preserve uh, pieces of tissues that I then put in liquid nitrogen for eventual RNA-seq data. So then you could do transcriptomics on multiple individuals. So this is also one of the nice advantages. I mean, it's, it's sad, you know, when animals die in zoos, but often they do die of old age or because of, a, you know, they develop health problems that reduces the quality of their health. And so we can collect transcriptomic tissues um, or tissues for transcriptomic analysis, um, including from the gonads, for example. So this is what we're doing with uh, and several other species. We have large um, banks of um, say ovaries and testes from male and female animals um, that we can then use to, you know, investigate um, these genes associated with fertility in a much, much more detailed way. So we're going to be doing that in the Dama gazelle very soon. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning with when I showed the pipeline is that, you know, we are now, um, I'm working with a scientist here in the U.S., um, as you probably, all of you know, is that we now have a telomere to telomere assembly of the human genome. So we know now how to do basically complete, you know, genomes for mammals and other species. And so one of the next species that's being done is the cow. Um, and so the people who are doing the cow reached out to me and asked, you know, they would like to do some distant relatives of a cow. So antelope, like the Gadama gazelle, are in the same family as we find cows and goats and sheep, for example. So I've sent them a sample of Dama gazelle um, for them to generate a telomere to telomere assembly. So we'll have a much more contiguous assembly um, and that will be annotated using a whole um, variety of different tissues. Um, and this will allow us to basically get a better understanding of not only single nucleotide polymorphisms, but eventually also 
uh, structural variance. I'm very interested in structural variance. Now, with regards to your second question, um, basically, um, you know, the way we can solve these problems is just by doing um, breeding. So informed breeding, that is, you know, with this genomic data, you can, you can screen hundreds and hundreds of individuals now. So we can, for example, develop a targeted SNP um, probe set that includes both neutral variants and functional variants, like, for example, the variants that are found, loss of function variants that are found in um, some of these fertility-related genes. And then we can, can, can screen the entire population. And then using that data, we can then inform who should be bred with who. So usually what we do in the zoo is that we use a pedigree to basically determine the relatedness among all individuals within a zoo population. And to maintain um, genetic diversity or reduce the loss of genetic diversity, we usually take two, the, you know, the most unrelated male and female, and we breed them together. Um, <clears throat> now, that doesn't always work because, you know, those males and females, they prefer, you know, who they, especially the female prefers, likes to choose who they want to mate with. So it doesn't always work out. But the other information that we're providing from genomics is that we can provide information on who's carrying the most damaging mutations um, and we can, or try to screen for that and then determine, you know, which breeding pair would basically help remove those damaging mutations um, from the population or minimize their impact in say successive generations in the population. So basically we're using genetic monitoring of these type of variants to inform conservation breeding positions. This is how, for example, we can start reducing this problem in something like the Mahor Gazelle. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, another question, what is your prediction sure. about the destiny of uh, uh, Mahor Gazelle? Uh, will, it, will this population, subpopulation uh, survive? Yes, uh, I think, you know, that's a tough question, you know, because, you know, will it survive in captivity? Yes, because we've done a very good job for almost 50 years of maintaining the species and, you know, populations are getting healthier. Um, so, like I said, just within the last four years or so, they started reintroducing Adra gazelles and Mahor gazelles back into um, preserves in Morocco and in Chad. Um, and so far, the Mahor gazelle populations in Morocco are doing fine. You know, th that is, you know, the, the ultimate test of whether you can restore a species back into its native habitat is that it doesn't need human intervention anymore. And so, you know, and of course, you know, preserves are not the typical environment. They're protected, you know, for animals and nature in general. And so, yeah, if we maintain these preserves, if people, you know, enforce the rules and avoid them from being hunted and or poached, for example, then yes, I think the uh -huh. Mahor gazelle has a good chance of, you know, surviving into the future. You know, ultimately, I, I think about this, the way I usually tell this to my students in my conservation biology class is that, you know, all forms of life on earth are ultimately dependent on human beings, you know, wanting to do the right thing in terms of like, you know, protecting habitats, protecting species, and making sure, you know, populations are as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in this case, in the captivity, they uh, should uh, uh, should uh, <clears throat> lose some fitness. Uh, and uh, if uh, we'll decide, uh, for example, to back it back them to a natural environment, they will most likely. So I, I'm not sure that will that they will survive. Yeah, no, I mean it's again the future is unpredictable. So you know we've only started the reintroduction process for a few years, and so far they're doing fine. But they are being monitored, you know, by wildlife biologists every year and counted and so on and so forth. So. You know, I mean, and lots of money and effort went into, you know, launching these reintroduction programs, but you're right. I mean, whether they'll survive or not is ultimately unpredictable, but, you know, all we can do is hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. I think your work uh, with uh, such a detailed screening on genome level should help uh, significantly increase the fitness even in, in the captivity. 
yeah, uh, do this. Any other questions? Why diversity in mitochondria uh, is uh, the mark uh, about uh, whether we can or can't uh, hybridize our species? Oh, um, there's not so much. I think the whole genome approach is, yeah. I mean, at that time, you know, back in 2014, you know, the idea is that if, for example, um, each subspecies of Dama gazelle. And so my colleague, Helen Zen, she tested, you know, she had samples from all three subspecies. And the prediction was that if these are really distinct subspecies, then, you know, they should find haplotypes that are distinct to each subspecies. And because they weren't that, you know, basically Adra gazelle haplotypes were mixed with Mohor gazelle haplotypes and vice versa. And the central, you know, subspecies was mixed with the others as well, that this was an argument that, you know, this, this data and analysis was used as an argument to show that, well, perhaps there's not a lot of differences um, between these subspecies. That yes, morphologically they look different, but you know, that morphology could simply be, you know, the expression of clinal variation, right? Just a few genes in the genome that might cause, you know, Mohor gazelles to be darker on the eastern part of the range and Adder gazelles to be lighter in the uh, mm -hmm. eastern part the eastern part of the range. And so, so, so they used that basically that that study was used to basically build this experimental population in, um, in the United Arab Emirates, um, just simply because, you know, our expectation is that populations that are highly differentiated and have been highly differentiated for a long time should show reciprocal monophyly of haplotypes. But since these Dama gazelle populations didn't, then this was thought to represent that these populations once were, you know, intermingling or mixing with each other in the past. But again, you know, my criticism of the study is it didn't take into account, you know, basically the, the dynamics of mitochondrial DNA evolution, you know, because it's very easy for, you know, to misinterpret, you know, data that comes from just a single locus like that. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, yeah. Could you please uh, tell other, like, tell us other interesting species which you are working now? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to. Yeah. So um, I'm going to share my screen really quick again. Um, Yeah, so this is uh, also one of like um, this species. So this is the black-footed ferret. So this is a very famous species in conservation biology because you know it was once thought to be extinct, um, and then the last colony was discovered um, in the 1980s and was brought into captivity and then rescued from extinction because of captive breeding. So. This is a species because of the way it was maintained in zoos and so on was, you know, rescued from extinction. That's why it's so famous. And, you know, basically this species also went through a, a population bottleneck. You know, it's a grassland species um, found across the Midwestern portion of North America. And, you know, it was, it died out because of disease and because of cattle ranching. So cattle ranchers basically killed off the prey of this species, which is a which is a what's what's called a prairie dog. It's a ground squirrel, um, and ground squirrels make all these holes um, that they live in in the ground. And, and for cattle ranching, that's not good because cattle can break their legs in these holes. So basically, cattle ranchers poisoned and killed off all these prairie dogs. And black-footed ferrets are specialized on hunting this type of species, and so their populations declined. So basically all living black-footed ferrets um, alive today are descended from seven founder individuals. So two males and um, five females. And so, and of course, um, <clears throat> this species, you know, because of what I just told you about with Dama gazelles, we'd also expect um, that um, 
the genetic diversity would be relatively low and inbreeding very high. And that's exactly what we find. So this is one of the results of, of I'm showing from this species is that here, you know, we generated a reference genome assembly of a male and then we resequenced 54 individuals. So we did whole genome resequencing at about 30x coverage um, for 54 individuals from different populations. And so on the left side is the basically the heterozygosity. So um, these are from wild born. So the green bars are from animals that were born in the wild. Red are from captive born animals. And then um, the blue bars are animals that have been reintroduced back into the wild. So this pop, this species has also been very successful in reintroducing it back into the wild. But as you see on the x-axis here, um, the mean heterozygosity is very, very low. So this is actually one of the mammal species for which genome data have been generated that has some of the lowest genome-wide diversity ever recorded of any mammal species. And the level of inbreeding is also very, very high. So, you know, the genome is only about 2.5 gigabases in size. And so, you know, 80% of the genome is just in runs of homozygosity. And we find very, very large blocks of homozygosity. So these orange bars here on the ROH plot on the right side um, are runs of homozygosity in sizes of 25 megabases or greater. So do we find, for example, some, um, some of the chromosomes in the black-footed fair genome have almost no variation across the entire chromosome. So it's very stunning. So this is a species, again, that I work very closely with. I also am working with cheetahs um, from Africa. So we have a captive breeding population of cheetahs at the Smithsonian National Zoo. And I'm also starting to work on several other species of, of you know, hoofed animals, like um, another oryx found in Africa, and then an Asian deer called Els deer, which is also a critically endangered species um, that the Smithsonian has been working with for a long time. So yeah, so I've been working, yeah, that's what's nice, um, you know, working at a zoo is that there's not a single species that's not interesting. That is, you know, you look at a species, what, what are its problems? Could they be genetic? How long is, what is the history of the species? What's the biology of the species? And this is basically, you know, the foundation that we use to develop programs or, you know, a genomic uh, research program around any species that is found in captivity that, you know, is at the National Zoo or in other places um, or other zoos around the world. So, yeah. All right, if there aren't any more questions, I guess um, I'll, I'll say goodbye, but thank you very much for um, um, participating today and thanks for the excellent questions. Um, and I hope you found the seminar interesting and uh, Lada can give you my um, email. And if you have any more questions, feel free, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to um, discuss some of the topics I mentioned today during my talk with you over email as well. So. Thank you again, Lada, uh, for organizing this. And um, yeah, thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you very much for such an interesting talk today. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.